Is this the beginning of the end? Is this the Gog Magog? We don't know that. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu knows that. What we do know is that it certainly does feel like it. It certainly does feel like it. It certainly does feel like this could be the end, but we don't know for sure. It could be just another warning from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, a much bigger warning than we've gotten uh, in at least the last 70 years, 80 years uh, since the Holocaust, but certainly another warning for us to do tshuva immediately. As I mentioned, but the hidden Sadiq that foresaw this, this war, this massacre that took place uh, ahead of time, tell us that uh, Hashem is simply telling us there's no more patience, there's no more time for, for Jewish people to tiptoe into Judaism and just keep some mitzvot that they like. We have to keep everything. There's no more sugar coating, there's no more discounts. Anyone that wants to be part of the Jewish people that's going to be saved, that's going to be brought to salvation, has to do complete shuvah. Everything that you know, you have to do. And whatever you don't know, you have to learn it and then start doing it. So, if this is the beginning of the end or not, we're going to find out soon enough. But regardless of that, it's not like everything happens in two minutes. It's a process. How do we know it's a process? Because we have a map. We have a map of what everything looks like in the end. That was given to us by Akadosh Baruch Hu with the last prophet. The prophet Malachi. This is the last prophet that we had. And he gave us a map of what the end of days will look like. And if you look at the verses, you look at only a few chapters in the entire book, and you read it with commentary, you're literally going to see the last 10, 15 years drawn out with as clear as day picture. Hashem rebuking us, Hashem clarifying to us what He wants from us, and of course, Hashem eventually bringing us to salvation. In the first chapter of the prophet Malachi, HaKadosh Baruch Hu explains to us that although He's allowing us to live in Edom's countries, never think for a moment that Edom is truly your brother that wants your best interest. There are certainly good uh, uh, non-Jews out there that are part of Chazdeu Mota Olam, the, the righteous Noahides, the, as I said before, one-third of the world will survive or uh, one-third of the world will uh, be given a chance to survive. And many of them, obviously most of them, are going to be non-Jews. Because even if, you know, uh, uh, 100% of the Jews survive, we only have, what, 15, 20 million Jews in the world. So even if, theoretically speaking, 100% of them survive, which is unfortunately not going to happen unless everybody does too well, uh, that still leaves a whole lot of room between the 20 million and the you know couple of billion that makes one-third of the world. So there's certainly a lot of righteous uh, people in America, in, in Canada, in a, uh, uh, Australia, and all over Europe, all over the world. But this does not mean that everybody's righteous, and this also doesn't mean that everybody's wicked. You just have to understand that HaKadosh Baruch is telling us Regardless of whether they're righteous or they're wicked, whether they're your friend or they're your enemy, never think for a moment that you're the same. You're never allowed to marry each other. A Jew is not allowed to marry a non-Jew. A non-Jew is not allowed to marry a Jew. You're allowed to conduct business with each other if you'd like, as long as you're honest with each other and you have integrity. But don't think that just because you're able to do business with each other, you're able to also marry each other's kids. No. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has already told us that there's going to come a time at the end of days where this relationship between the Jews, Yaakov, and Edom is going to become blurry. Why? Because the Jewish people after the Holocaust, and after experiencing so much anti-Semitism, so much hatred, so much blood being spilled, they were uh, happy to see somebody not kill them. And they got comfortably numb spiritually in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, in England, in different parts of the world that they uh, went to after 
the Holocaust. And before you know it, they, uh, many of them went and started marrying non-Jews and uh, forgetting about their Judaism altogether, forgetting about what happened during the Holocaust, forgetting about why it even happened. And, uh, you know, blaming the politicians instead of blaming the actions of the individuals. Uh, blaming people instead of understanding that it all came from God. So, the Prophet says, I loved you, says Hashem. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esav the brother of Yaakov, the word of Hashem? Yet I loved Yaakov, but I hated Esav. I made his mountains a desolation and gave his heritage to the desert serpents. Though Edom will say, we have become destitute, but we will return and rebuild the ruins. Thus says Hashem, master of legions. They may build, but I will tear down. They will be called the boundary of the wickedness and the people whom Hashem had condemned forever. And your eyes will behold it. And you will say upon the territory of Israel, may Hashem be glorified. So here Hashem is in essence telling us that for all of the Jews that are thinking that there's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile, there is. There are good ones, there are bad ones. But if this Gentile is connecting with the idolatrous beliefs that they have, is an enemy of Israel, is a person that hates Jews, uh, you have to understand this is part of Edom, this is part of Esav. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I hate Esav. I love Yaakov, I hate Esav. And Esav is not just an individual that lived a few thousand years ago. Esav is the representation of the nation of Edom. The nation of Edom includes America. It's not just America, it's obviously uh, many others, uh, whether it be Russia or Europe, but it's pretty much everybody that's not, uh, almost everybody that's not uh, Ishmael. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us this uh, Judeo-Christian relations that so many Jews have been focusing on for the last 30 years, 40 years, are not the will of Hashem. If somebody wants to convert to Judaism, not only are they allowed to convert to there, but in fact, the Torah speaks about 36 different times how much Hashem favors the converts and loves the converts. Meaning that Judaism is open for everybody. It's not just for the people that are born Jewish. But if somebody unites with the Edom mentality of idolatry, of atheism, of anti-Semitism, then, and you say, listen, let's, uh, let's befriend them because they have some money and they're willing to invest in Israel. They have some land and they're allowing us to live there. Uh, and all types of things. You're not understanding who runs the world. So this is something that unfortunately many Jews have uh, ignored and the first part of the prophet Malachi discusses it. The next part, it says in uh, same chapter 1, verse 6, a son will honor his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says Hashem, master of legions. To you, the Kohanim who scorn my name, Yet you say, how have we scorned your name? You present on my altar loathsome food, and you say, how have I loathed you? By your saying, the table of Hashem is repulsive. Here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is rebuking us. Rebuking us because we have simply had stopped preaching the truth. Many Jews have not only abandoned the Jewish path and the Jewish religion and the Jewish belief system, but they still feel Jewish and no one tells them otherwise. They violate Shabbat, they drive on Shabbat, they, they do all types of things that are against the Torah. And just because they show up to synagogue once a year, everyone you know thinks, oh, I'm still Jewish. And the reality is the secular mentality has become something that has much more strength than any other time in history. And part of the reason is because the leaders, the Kohanim, the ones that were supposed to teach the truth, 
really did not. Really did not. And it's become a national disrespect of the Torah in a higher magnitude than we've seen in recent history. Where people, that are Jewish people, that are born to Jewish mothers and fathers, felt perfectly fine violating the Torah in every way, shape, or form, whether it's in desecrating of Shabbat, or, or dancing in front of some idol, you know, just, uh, you know, instead of going to, 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 to the synagogue a, a couple of days ago, they were dancing in front of an idol, or it's a immodesty, or immorality, all types of things that somehow or another, we all knew was wrong when we were kids. And we always said, oh, we'll do better. And now it's gone to the point where many Jews don't even know it's wrong. Many Jews don't even know that they're not supposed to drive on Shabbat because across America, across different parts of the world, many Jewish people literally drive to synagogue on Shabbat without even realizing there's something wrong there because the leaders are not telling them the truth. So there's no hope for many people to even hear the truth because when they finally get to the source of truth, they finally go to the synagogue, to the Bet Midrash, to the Shior, the speaker is not going to tell them, hey, by the way, buddy, if you want to be Jewish, you have to observe Shabbat, which means you cannot drive on Shabbat. If you want to be Jewish, you can't pray to a foreign God. You can't believe that God is two or three or, 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 or 30 or whatever other numbers they come up with. You can't believe that just because you gave charity, that means you can make every sin under the sun. We're not Christianity. We're not Catholicism. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu, second part of Malachi tells us how this is the next thing that's going to happen. And this is something that happened into a much larger extent in the last 20 years than it did in the last 70 years. And really any time before that. Uh, after that, another message the Prophet gives us is that this whole notion that you give charity and everything else is good, as I mentioned before. Where he says, I have no desire for you, said Hashem, Master of Legions, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place where offerings are presented to my name, and also pure meal offerings. For my name is great among the nations, says Hashem, Master of Legions. But you defile it by your saying, the table of the Lord is loathsome, and your description of it as uh, its food is repulsive. You say, behold, this offering is so burdensome, and you, and so you vex him, says Hashem, Master of Legions. You bring the stolen to the lame, the sick animal, and bring it as an offering. Shall I accept it from your hand, says Hashem? Cursed be the charlatan who has a superior ram in his flock, but vows and sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am great, a great king, says Hashem, master of legions, and my name is awesome among the nations. Here, Kadosh Baruch Hu is simply telling us that the charity that people are sometimes giving certainly is good, but sometimes people are giving money that's not even theirs. Either they're giving money that they... Uh, you know, stole, or they're giving money that was acquired, uh, you know, against the Torah, like all types of businesses that are, uh, you know, committing uh, 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 violations against the Torah, and sometimes even the law of the land. Um, and the reality is, is that many times you have people completely shut their 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 eyes and their their brain even. As soon as somebody rich walks into the community and into the synagogue and is willing to donate money, they don't care about the fact that he's intermarried, completely assimilated, completely cares less about the Torah, and he's only doing this because you know he's uh, he wants people to like him or he wants to uh, look like a big shot. And they'll accept his charity. They'll even uh, start giving him all types of uh, names of uh, oh, he's a righteous person, he's a good guy, he's a good heart. And the reality is, a kadosh who says this is not this is not charity. This is not, this is ruining. You're not helping this person. You're not helping the community. You're hurting. You're hurting everybody by doing this. Furthermore, the prophet says that 
when it comes to the truth, the people that have the truth have to say it. Who is the people that have the truth? These are the Torah scholars, who are also known as the Levi tribe. Not because they're all Torah scholars are from the Levi tribe, but uh, the Rambam says that anyone that dedicates their life to learning Torah as their priority in life, number one, meaning that's, that's what they are, they're a Torah scholar, they're considered as if they're the Levi tribe. Because they're serving Hashem, just like the Levi tribe served in the Bet HaMikdash. But in chapter 2 of the book of Malachi, he says, Know that I have sent this commandment to you, so that my covenant should be with Levi, says Hashem, Master of Legions. My covenant was with him, life and peace. I gave these to him for the sake of the fear with which he feared me, for he was in awe of my name. The teaching of the truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not felled on his lips. He walked with me in peace and with fairness, and turned many away from iniquity. Here we see two major things. Two major things from the Levi tribe, the people that possess the truth, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, uh, gave, used their merit to give the rest of the nation uh, a chance. Number one, because they spoke the truth and they learned the truth. But number two, they turned away many from iniquity, meaning they went and did kiruv. Where else do we see this? The Gemara in Masechet Brachot says that at the time of the horrible situation that Am Yisrael was facing a couple thousand years ago, at the time of Rabbi Akiva, where it became illegal for anyone to teach Judaism, whether in private or in public, with a promise from the Edomite government that anyone that teaches Torah will be killed. Rabbi Akiva, who only feared God, not only did he go and teach Torah anyway, but he actually did even more of it. So much so that when somebody asked him, another Torah scholar said to him, Akiva, what are you doing? Why don't you, okay, if you want to learn Torah independently, in secret, and hiding, it's one thing. But you're going directly against the government order and you're teaching Torah in public and massive scale. You know, literally filling up stadiums full of people when the government told you don't even teach Torah at all. What are you doing? Rabbi Akiva told them, Rabbi Akiva told them, although I would like to learn Torah more on my own, although I can grow more spiritually on my own if I learn Torah, what makes us a nation, what makes us a Jew, what makes us a people is when we care about each other's spiritual growth. Meaning, what makes a person a true leader is if he goes like the Levi tribe and he makes sure that other Jews know the truth and therefore have the tools and the ability and the knowledge to stay away from sin, to stay away from the wrong path. Here we see Rabbi Akiva telling us the importance of helping other Jews do tshuva to such an extent that he risked his whole life and eventually lost his life as a result of his teaching in public. But he did this willingly and happily. Why? Because although a lot of people like to concern themselves with this physical uh, um, well-being of their fellow, the reality is the spiritual well-being of your fellow is even more important. Because the physical well-being of your fellow is critical and you need to help them if you see if there's somebody poor, if there's somebody in need, you know, we have a campaign right now that uh, we're uh, trying to do as much as possible to help the, the, the soldiers get a spiritual help by getting them tzitziot. And of course, the countless uh, Jewish people that are now, uh, you know, uh, pretty much uh, locked in their houses because you're not allowed to leave your house, really. Uh, you know, or, uh, or you shouldn't leave your house, really, I should say. Uh, not allowed to leave your house is coming soon, probably. They're already sending messages to everybody here that you should store water and you should store lights and batteries for at least several days. And uh, of course, you know, many people here are, you know, have no idea what to do. Like, this is something that reminds some people from what happened in the, uh, the corona time. Uh, but the truth is that the corona time, uh, there was no missiles in the air. 
uh, and there's no war uh, that uh, was uh, uh, at massive scale like there is right now. But what's happening is that the it's not just the victims that got massacred, it's not just the victims that got hurt by the shots, but really there's a lot of other victims that are having even more financial difficulty than ever before because there's no government assistance, there's no help, and also they're not even allowed to, they're not even able to work. They're not able to go to the store. Uh, and in many of the stores, even if you go, they're closed. Uh, or there's a shortage in some places of, of certain products. The point being is, is that the, the amount of, uh, uh, of problems are much greater than what people know in the media and what people are reporting. And that's why we in our organization are doing everything we possibly can to help people uh, 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 you know, with, with, a, uh, uh, with food, with uh, uh, whatever resources we can to, uh, to, to, get them, uh, to get them help. And Bo Hashem, since we've done this quite a bit over the uh, years, most recently we did a major food distribution just a couple, uh, week and a half ago, we're helping people, but the amount of requests versus the amount of ability that we have are a world of difference. So we need as much help as possible. That's why we have the campaign uh, to for anyone that wants to help Jewish soldiers get spiritual help by getting tzitziot, or as people you want help uh, want to help us feed people that are in uh, in uh, in need, like this poor woman that contacted me just literally uh, maybe an hour before I started the lecture. That she has no food to eat. She has a family, five kids, and uh, they don't have money even to pay the electric. So, Hashem, we're able to help them uh, and send them some money. But this is not something that's uh, the norm. So, this is something that definitely gets people to want to help. But what Akadosh Baruch Hu is telling us here is that although it's important for you to care about your brother's physical well being, you should also care about his spiritual well-being. And the primary role that a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, a rabbi has is not only to care about the spiritual role of his fellow Jews, but to make sure to keep them away from sins. Now how can you keep them away from sins if you tell them Hashem forgives everyone no matter what, or like the heretics think God needs you, so therefore I'll never punish you, and all types of other nonsense. So here, Kadosh Baruch Hu is already telling us that in the end of days, Kiruv will be the number one priority to help people do tshuva, will be the number one priority, but unfortunately not many will take it up. Not many will support it. They may support you know, sending money to the Nazis in Ukraine. They may support, you know, uh, building another zoo. They may support building a museum. They may support even building a, another synagogue or a, uh, you know, another uh, religious center. But to support other Jews doing tshuva, not so much, not so much. The uh, the the amount of money that goes into helping Jews do tshuva versus all the other stuff is literally a world of difference. And even the places that many people donate to that uh, say that they're doing outreach, in reality, they're not doing outreach. They're just, you know, event centers. They just have events. They have, you know, uh, you know uh, get-togethers where uh, people can meet each other, eat, drink, get fat, uh, you know, make sense. But very few are actually telling them the truth about staying away from sins. And unfortunately, some of the biggest Torah organizations out there are afraid to tell people the truth. So much so that even when I go out there and I tell people about the importance of protecting your breed and not wasting seed and not being immoral and not doing things that are against the Torah, not, you know, what do they do? Instead of supporting it, they censor us. Oh, maybe you could, uh, you know, uh, do this lecture by cutting off this uh, part and that part and this part and out of two hours, maybe you'll have five minutes left. Or maybe you could say it uh, differently. Or maybe, what are, you, what are you censoring me for? I'm telling you what the, what the Torah says. I'm not saying things from my own, my own uh, words. But that's the problem. People are afraid to tell the truth, even if they do call themselves outreach uh, uh, organizations. And this is one of the things that HaKadosh Baruch says he's going to rebuke us of. Furthermore, the prophet Malachi talks to us in the same chapter 2 about heretics, 
and the war against heretics, that not only he has a war against them, but also the war that certain people will take against those heretics. Also the war against intermarriage, where he's denunciating intermarriage, where he's telling us that we don't all have one father. This mentality that we can marry everybody and anybody just because they're nice to us is a mistake. To, to such an extent that the Prophet says in the name of God that for those people who think that that uh, we all have one father and that not one uh, you know that one God not create us all. So why then is one person betrayed by another? in order to defile the covenant of the forefathers. Kedosh Baruch Hu says, Judah is betrayed, and an abomination has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has defiled the holy nation of Hashem, which he loved, and has taken in marriage the daughter of a foreign god. May Hashem eliminate from the man who does this any child and descendant from the tents of Yaakov, and anyone who might present an offering of Hashem, Master of Legions. Here, Kadosh Bechu rebukes every single Jew out there that's intermarried. Intermarried doesn't actually require you to be married to a non-Jew, but rather, if you are intimate with a non-Jew, that's considered intermarriage according to Judaism. If you are living together, that's intermarriage. You don't need to be you know, civilly married to be intermarried. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us that before the end of days, this will be one of the biggest problems we're facing. And in fact, here you know, in, in Israel, there certainly is intermarriage, but nowhere near as much as there is intermarriage in America, in England, in different parts of the world, where in America there's literally a better chance of you flying in the air like Superman than marrying a Jew in some communities. Uh, just because of uh, the complete confusion of what the truth is. So a person needs to understand that Akadosh Baruch Hu is telling us all of this will happen before the end of days. All of this will happen before the end of days. And he continues telling us that things will actually get worse for all of those people that think it's you know, just a, uh, a bad time, but it'll go away, because when the wrath comes, the wrath will come in a surprise, but in a much worse way than anyone can imagine. And he says the following, in chapter 3, In Hebrew it says, "Ineni sholech malachi upina derech lefanai upitom yavo elechalo adon asher atem evakshim umalach abrit asher atem chafetzim ineba amar adonai tzevot." Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will clear the path before me. Suddenly, the Lord whom you seek will come to his sanctuary and the messengers of the covenant for whom you yearn. Behold, he comes, says Hashem, Master of Legions. Here Hashem is telling us that he's going to send this messenger suddenly. Suddenly. Now many people think that he's talking about Mashiach in Eshali. But, or he's talking about uh, Eliyahu and Avi. But really, if we look at the verses, we see that he spells the word Eliyahu two different ways. Two different ways. Initially, he calls it Eliyah, and uh, later on, he says Eliyahu. So, the Ramban says that's because the initial messenger are going to be truth speakers. People that have are not going to be, the, he says he's, he he's going to be sending prophets, 
but not Navi. Navi is not always a prophet like we know, prophet that is able to tell the future. But a Navi is Nif Svatayim, people that are speakers, that tell the truth, that say the word of God. He's going to send those people, people that speak the truth to the Jewish people in Israel, to the Jewish people around the world, to wake them up. This wake-up call is going to happen before Eliyahu and Navi is going to come. This is going to happen before Eliyahu and Navi is going to come. Because once he comes, everything will be different. Now what's the goal of these initial people? These people that speak the truth? These messengers of Hashem? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Who can bear the day of His coming? And who can survive when He appears? For he, will, for he will be like a smelter's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit smelting and purifying silver. He will purify the children of Levi and refine them like gold and like silver. And they will be for Hashem's presenters of offerings and righteousness. So He is telling us that those truth speakers are going to help the other people that are perhaps have some Torah knowledge but are not necessarily telling people the truth, he's going to refine them. Why? Because the whole goal is to offer everybody a last chance. Everybody a last chance to do tshuva before the end. And he continues, and he says, I will draw near to you for the judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who exhort the wage of a worker, the widow and the orphan, and against those who wrong the stranger and do not fear me, says Hashem, Master of Legions. For I, Hashem, have not changed. And you, the sons of Yaakov, you have not perished. So here, Kadosh Baruch is telling us, listen, despite all the difficulties that I gave you, I never destroyed you. You haven't perished. And I myself haven't changed. I made you a promise, I'm going to keep you alive. But that doesn't mean that you continue doing whatever you want. I'm going to send you people that will speak the truth to you because the ultimate goal is for you to be given a chance to do tshuva one last time before the Mashiach comes. Because once the Mashiach comes, that's it. And that's why the next part talks about tshuva. Where everybody has to do tshuva before the final end. Those who do tshuva will acquire yirat shamayim. They'll acquire fear of heaven. And that's what the next section, after talking about tshuva talks about the extraordinary reward that people will have for fearing God, where he says, you have said it's useless to serve God. What gain is there for us that we have kept his watch and what and that we walk submissively before Hashem, Master of Legions? So now we praise the wicked, evildoers are built up. They have even tested God and escaped. So initially, at the end of the day, it's going to be confusing. Why? Because there's going to be some truth speakers, few, but some. And there's going to be a lot of false speakers. A lot of people teaching lies. Whether it's the media, or even fake rabbis that are uh, teaching people that no matter what, God will love you and will uh, give you salvation. And that nobody goes to hell, nobody goes to Gehenna, and all types of other nonsense. So it's going to be a time of confusion with people that don't know the truth 100%. Because it's going to look like the wicked people are winning. So Hashem says, those that, who fear Hashem spoke to one another, and Hashem listened and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before Him, for those who fear Hashem and those who give thought to His, hand, to his name, they will be a precious treasure for me, says Hashem, Master of Legions, on a day which I bring about. And I will have mercy on them as a man has mercy on his son who serves him. Then you will return and see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So here HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us that the confusion will grow before the ultimate end because it will look like the wicked are not being punished and the righteous sometimes uh, seems like they're being uh, punished or they're suffering. Shem says, no. If you actually do real tshuva, you listen to the truthful speakers, 
the truth that's out there, you'll see a reward. You'll see a reward unlike any other because you're going to be the one that's ultimately saved. Ultimately saved before this end. For behold, the day is coming. As he finishes the book of Malachi, chapter 3, just the next verse after, he says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the wicked people and all the evil doers will be like straw. And that coming day will burn them up, says Hashem, master of legions, so that it will not leave them a root or a branch, but a son of righteousness will shine for you who fear my name with healing in its rays, and you will go out and flourish like calves fanned in the stall, and you will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On that day that I bring about, says Hashem, Master of Legions, remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him at Choev, which is Mount Sinai, for all of Israel, its decrees and its statutes. Behold, I send you Eliyahu Navi before the coming of the great and awesome day of Hashem, and he will turn back to God the hearts of fathers with their sons and the hearts of sons with their fathers, lest they come and strike the land with utter destruction. So here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu finalizes the prophecies here from Malachi, the last prophet, and he says, despite the confusion that you're going to hear from heretics and all types of false speakers. In the end, those that have fear of the Almighty and truly serve Him will be rewarded dressed in, a, in a tremendous way. The first part of their reward is that they'll see them surviving and the wicked being burned up and destroyed. Along with the rest of the enemies of Ab Yisrael. And as he says... If you want to be part of those righteous, not only do you have to fear God, but you have to remember the Torah of Moshe, meaning you have to fulfill the entire Torah. No, just fulfill one of uh, one of the commandments that you like, and the rest of it you ignore. Whatever makes sense to you, and the rest of it you disregard. No, the whole thing. The whole thing you have to keep. Because once Eliyahu and Avi comes on that great and awesome day, He's going to be the one that's, in essence, going to push over anyone that's on the fence, that's been trying but hasn't succeeding, but he's trying, he really wants to do it, he needs something. Why? Lest they come and strike the land with utter destruction. He says, either you do tshuva as soon as possible, through speeches, through the videos, through the books, or you're going to see the you're going to see and even be part of the destruction. So here we see Rabbutai Karim, and there's much, much more, but I've already taken enough time to explain this to you. The last prophet that we have, the prophet Malachi, literally the more you learn this book, the more you see the end of days that we are in play out, play by play, Decade by decade, everything that's happened to Am Yisrael in the last 30 or 40 years, you see all of it, especially in the last 10 years of things that have happened. But the same token, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you a map. He says, if you want to survive, if you want to be one of those that gets the ultimate salvation, first and foremost, you should know the salvation at the end of days is not going to be like the salvation of coming out of Egypt. Why? Coming out of Egypt, despite the fact that we saw miracles and wonders, only a small part of Am Yisrael came out of Egypt. 20% of Am Yisrael came out of Egypt. Some say even less. The rest of them, Hashem killed them because they did not want to repent. They didn't want to do tshuva. They didn't want to leave Egypt. They didn't want to leave the idolatry. So Hashem killed all of them during the plague of darkness. So only 20% of Am Yisrael came out of Egypt and went to Mount Sinai. And even the ones that went to Mount Sinai, they still had major difficulties. Throughout that salvation, there was major difficulties. Yes, they were no longer slaves to the Egyptians, but they still got punished severely for idolatry, for immorality, for complaining, one of the most... Uh, 
uh, disregarded sins that are out there, literally, people who think that complaining is a mitzvah, you would think. They complain so much. Not realizing that Hashem nearly destroyed Am Yisrael ten times in the desert because of their complaining. So, before you complain, before you uh, 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 mock, before you say foolish things, realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is offering us an opportunity of all opportunities, where he's telling us that those that actually listen to the truth, those that follow the truth, acquire a real awe of God by following the Holy Torah, their ultimate salvation will be much greater than the salvation that was brought to us when we came out of Egypt, when he took us out of Egypt. Why? Because once this salvation comes, there's no more hardship. There's no more difficulties. There's no more terrorist attacks. There's no more war. There's no more fighting uh, with your evil inclination so you don't watch things that are forbidden to watch. No more of that. All you're going to have is salvation. But if you played games with God and you weren't really serious or you continued listening to the heretics or you continued acting and having the same beliefs as heretics, continued mocking the Torah, continued cleaving yourself to the sins, then Hashem promises that He will destroy you along with the rest of the enemies of Am Yisrael. Meaning He will put the wicked Jews in the same place as He puts wicked Nazis. Why? Because He's giving us a serious chance. And He wrote to us clearly nearly over 2,000 years ago over 2,000 years ago, this is written by the last prophet, all of these things will happen before the end of days. And as we see clearly with open eyes, anyone that's been simply following the basics of Judaism and the Jewish people over the last decade sees literally every one of these things played out over the last 10 years especially, but even more so, you, uh, you could see over the last 30 years. And now we're in a position where this war that we're in could be the beginning of the end, meaning that you have a dome coming to help Israel fight against Ishmael, but according to the prophecies, this could easily turn into a friend turning into a foe, but a foe unlike any other foe we've ever had, because now it becomes a biblical war of, you know, beyond all proportions that we can recognize. But this is also one step before the ultimate salvation. Now, if you're afraid of the bombs, you're afraid of the terrorists, you're afraid of uh, whatever it is that you're afraid of, that means you don't really believe that this prophecy can help you. Now, the only reason why you would not believe that this prophecy could help you is either because you're still wicked and you're not willing to change your ways, or because... You simply are a heretic and you don't believe that the prophecies are true. Either way, you're in trouble. And it's important for a person to teach this to themselves because your kids are going to ask you questions. They're going to ask you, Ima, Abba, what, what, what's happening in Israel? What are you going to tell them? Nothing? Everything's okay? You're going to pretend like there's no uh, missiles in the sky? It wasn't just a few thousand people murdered. Now again, you don't need to necessarily tell little kids every single gruesome details, but they need to be aware of what makes them a Jew. Why should they continue being a Jew? What could be for, available for them if they follow the truthful Torah path? They could have the ultimate protection where no matter what's happening in the world, whether it be missiles, or be terrorists, or be whatever it is, they have a unique protection. Because like, remember, the last exile, the last exodus that we have, the last salvation that we have right now, ahead of us, is much greater than the first one, where the first one, we still suffered. We still you know, had major difficulties in the desert. This one, there's no suffering. If you're on a righteous path, if you have 
followed what Hashem said, you have full protection and have nothing to worry about. You don't have to worry about terrorists. You don't have to worry about Palestinians. You don't have to worry about the government. You don't have to worry about anything. Why? Because you have Hashem with you. So if you're not a heretic and you believe this, then that means that the only thing you have left to do is to make sure that you are that person that's righteous, that's literally doing their best to fulfill the entire Torah. If that means you have to force yourself to learn all the laws of Shabbat so you can keep Shabbat appropriately, then do it. If that means you have to throw that television into the garbage, and if you need the computer to throw in the garbage also, uh, as long as you continue watching the lectures and get chizuk, you don't need TV, you don't need a computer. All you need is a way to listen to Shuret Torah, and that's it. But if you continue watching TV, you continue watching movies, guess what? Your neshama will never be clean. You'll never be in the righteous category. You're never going to be in the righteous category. Why? Because you're constantly you know, dirtying your neshama with filth that you're watching on TV and the movies and all the filth that's out there. So if all it's going to take for you to go from wicked to righteous is just that one mitzvah of throwing out your television, throwing out the pornography, throwing out the movies, throwing out the illegitimate businesses that are against the Torah, like like you know lending money with high interest or or selling goods that are you know used but really is new, or all types of other crooked businesses that people are involved in. If all it's going to take to move you from being wicked to righteous is just making those changes, now is the time to do it. If all it's going to take to take you from righteous to wicked is for you to force yourself to become more generous and care about your brothers regardless of whether they're your blood brothers or they're your spiritual brothers as part of Am Yisrael, then force yourself to be generous and help them. Because right now, it doesn't matter what you have in the bank and what you have in the stock market, and how many houses you have, and how many buildings you have. Because if this is the end, or the beginning of the end, none of that stuff is going to matter. None of that stuff is going to matter. It's not going to matter if, if silver and gold go up to the roof like you predicted, or if Bitcoin becomes the dominant coin, or if your property values go back up to where they used to be, or if the stock market crashes. None of that stuff is going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is how does a Kadosh Baruch Hu view you as part of the righteous that have fear of God or as part of the wicked that lived for this world. This is why I tell people, push yourself extra. Now is the time. Whether this is the end, I don't think it's the end, but certainly it could be the beginning of the end. The reason why I don't think it's the end is simply because the prophet says that the end is going to be much, much worse. Two-thirds of the world are going to die in a, in a matter of minutes. You know, a few thousand people died. With all due respect to everybody, two, a few thousand people is not two-thirds of the world. Even though each Jew is worth like the value of the whole world, the reality is still what the Pasuk says, what the verse says, two-thirds of the world. So this is nothing in comparison to the end. But it certainly could be the beginning of the end as we saw from what's happening in the world, and according to what the Malbim says. So right now, this is the time to push full force into doing tshuva, into doing chesed, into giving charity to righteous causes, to real causes, not to just some fairy tale places. It's the time to improve your prayer, improve your life. I've heard enough new arrival screams. Echoing through the hallway to know that this ain't good. Once they pass them through the infierno, they don't come back. It's enough to make you go crazy. Do not think we fear you, spirit. We know your power is born of evil. This is your last night in the land of the living. You understand me, Malavan Demon?
possesses the cure you seek. Go within. Just now, once you cross that threshold, there is only one way out. There was a rich family that lived here called the Hetheringtons, and unfortunately, their daughter passed away of a heart attack inside the house. Basically, they were so devastated that they reached out to people claiming to be psychic mediums. They actually weren't psychic mediums. They opened up a total of 11 portals inside this house and invited spirits and entities from all different kinds of dimensions. Well, I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. To be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't. There's going to be some graphic details. This place is a maze. The person after death went to a place called Sheol. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. People go to a place and they experience weird things. And sometimes they actually will see a character of some type. Well, where did that come from? I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. They may describe feeling profoundly peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light. Some people describe watching doctors and nurses working on them with incredible accuracy. Next thing I knew, I was above my body watching the operation. How long did you feel like you were gone? I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second, it could have been five minutes. I don't know. Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? As I'm lying there, I realize that there's a, an evil presence next to me. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? Holy oh, get out of here! Oh my god, dude! Strange things keep happening. Bizarre nightmares, as if I'm on fire. <gasps> Whoa, what the hell is this? Man, I've got bad chest pain. Satan's Hollow is what it's called, the portal to hell. Some people calling it an eye of fire, while others said it looked like the portal to hell opening up. And the next thing I know, I was outside of my body, looking at my body. What I'm going to do is called claromancy, the art of throwing lots or throwing bones. 2,000 years of experience, passed down, recorded, of how demons work. God has them all on a leash, and he lets the leash go enough to let them tempt us, because that's what makes us spiritually stronger. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about. Here. It's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Is there an afterlife? Is there a this God? This is the type of information that can keep you away from the itself. What happens to us after we die?